Welcome to our live. Well, well, welcome to our live program. We are here. We are going to be making um, the Sweet Dreams mask today with National Quilter Circle. So if you haven't um, had a chance to go in and click on the link and download the pattern, do so. Or you can wait to the very end and go back and and click on the link there. But make sure that you get that pattern because there is a template in there today. So I'm Colleen Tauke. I'm the one that's going to walk you through at least two different versions of the Sweet Dreams mask. Um, there are um, instructions for making it pieced. And then for those of you who really want a quick all one fabric, this is a great way to use up scraps. So um, if you've got those holiday scraps or you've got fabric left over from quilts, I've got the project that can go as a stocking stuffer. It could be um, something, maybe you wanna make something for the people in your quilt guild and you need something small, or you're going to a quilt retreat, and you love to have those little special things that you can share with your table mates or everybody at the quilt retreat. So this is going to be maybe the project that you might be interest in, in, interested in creating. So let's gather up the things that we need for our Sweet, sweet Dreams mask. Oh, also in the chat section, let me know where you're watching from. I love to see as we pop in from all across the country and outside of the United States into Canada, um, South America, we stretch clear into Europe. Um, it is great to see your names pop up. So let me know where you're watching from. I love to go back in later and chat with you. Um, we are going to be making that sweet dreams. And on the second page of it, it will go through materials list. Now, Maybe you want to try one of each. Maybe you're just thinking, I'm just going to use the solid fabric and not do any piecing. So in the materials list, I have denoted if you're making it from a solid fabric, what you need. And if you're going to be a, doing a piecing version, what your requirements are there also. It's a little bit different as we go through this. So um, choose the one you want. I'm going to walk you through both of these constructions so that it's a very easy process. So we are um, glad that you're joining us, Katie from uh, Sharon from Katie, Texas. I would look at the name Katie and I think of my daughter. So that was why I mixed it up. But we are glad that you're here. Deborah from Northern Ontario, Canada, and Pat from Victoria, British Columbia. I love that you're here. We also have Patricia from Newfoundland, Canada. See, I told you the Canadians are awake and ready to sew today. So let's get into our project. Now, you can pick fabrics that are maybe specific to the person you're giving it to, or you can pick like a theme. On this one, um, I had fabric left over from making those dreaded masks that we were all wearing for a while. And I had picked a Christmas theme with llamas on it for a specific person in my family who just thinks that llamas are the cutest. So in the um, fabric requirements, it'll tell you how much now. The one thing I wanted, I did def, um, define it later in the instructions, but if you're kind of new to quilting, when you see the letters capital F and the letter eight, that means a fat eighth of fabric. You may have heard the term fat quarter, which means a quarter yard of fabric, but cut a little differently in the 22 by 18 dimension. A fat eighth would be then nine inches by 22. So if you have at least a nine by 22 piece, you can easily make one or two, maybe three of these um, from fat eighths. So know that that's a term maybe you haven't um, run across yet in patterns or in um, your, your quilting adventures. So a fat eighth is what I'm requiring there. Um, focus fabric, oh, of course, find something fun I've got some strips. We're going to do a strip piece one too. So some pieces of fabric. And I'm talking about using either flannel or a fleece on the back. Something that's going to be really soft and cuddly against your, your face. You can use just quilters cotton if that's what you have access to. But from my sewing adventures <laughs> over the years, I never threw anything away. So I had leftover fleece and then some um, kind of a Berber kind of fabric that as I put it up to the camera, I don't know if it'll pick up the texture of it, but it's a kind of a loop fabric and a tweed. So I had a piece of that left and it worked also. So you can either use the fleecy stuff as a back or you can use a, a piece of flannel as the backing. 
Um, we're going to need some scrap pieces of batting um, that are about nine by five in rectangle shape. So, you know, that scrap of battings that when you're trimming your quilts and you keep throwing them in, in a bin and you're like, I don't know what to do with these, go grab those out. They work perfect for this, exactly what I did. I went through that back basket on the back of my door and I found the pieces that I needed. And then um, a foundation, if you're doing foundation pieced. So this one has the strips built on a foundation and that can be any piece of fabric. Um, an inexpensive piece of a muslin fabric. It could be um, a leftover piece of a backing fabric. As long as it's not bright and um, densely colored that might show through your lighter fabric. So anything is a foundation inside of those. Of course, we're always gonna need our rotary cutter, cutting mat. Um, we're also gonna need that pair of scissors um, for the trimming things that we're gonna be using. Um, for cutting out simple rectangles, of course, I use the eight by 24 or eight by 14 ruler a lot, um, but any size similar to that so that you can cut out your rectangles and cut sh um, strips for if you're doing the foundation piecing. Um, let's see, what else in that? Um, Oh, we're going to need some elastic. I'm using, I think it's the quarter inch. Yep, the quarter inch elastic. Now, elastic was in short supply for quite a while out there when we were back making masks. And there are some elastics out there that are more of a rolled type elastic that come in different colors. Uh, I didn't have any of that left anymore. So I went to the just a, a simple black um, elastic. That way, if it gets used a lot, it won't um, pick up any um, soil from fingers that you can see. So a simple black elastic. And you'll need about, I think I put on there, um, about half a yard or so. You probably have this stashed away from previous projects. So go get those pieces out. Um, and we will cut that to fit later. Then there's that paper template that is in your pattern. So on page five, it will give you that paper template. Now, I enjoy using paper templates, but a lot of times I will transfer those to like a cardstock or something a little bit heavier so it's really easy to trace around, especially if you're gonna be making a lot of these. And then also trace and uh, transfer those markings for where the opening to leave a turning spot, because we're gonna do a stitch around the outside and turn it like a pillow. And then make sure that you mark the um, placement for the elastic strap on each end of this. Now, when you're um, printing this out, there is a one inch kind of registration square. So hopefully when you go to print yours out, have it um, print exact match, um, it should be a one inch. If it's off by a little bit, it's not the end of the world. Close counts in this kind of quilting. So if it's very, very close to the one inch, you'll be okay. But um, my intention was that this come out one inch so that your uh, mask will be um, the same size as the one I had created. Okay, so once you have all of those things, oh, you're also going to need that fabric marking tool of some sort, your favorite. Um, I use a friction pen a lot or a friction marker a lot, but remember I'm always marking on the back side of my fabric with these in case any ghost lines. Once heat hits this marking, it's gone, but it can leave a little bit of a ghost line behind. So these are always used on um, the back side of fabrics or in a seam allowance area so that any ghost lines won't appear on the finished project. So you will need some kind of a fabric marking tool there. Okay, for the solid mass, let's, let's get into the construction. Let's see if we have, um, good morning from Sandy from Spokane, Washington. Um, I can't, I think it's Charlene, no, I can't read it. My, my bifocals won't get me there. Sorry, someone from Quebec, Quebec. glad that you're with us. Um, we have people watching from everywhere. This is fun. We are getting into that winter time. So, you know, sleep is important. Um, yes, it's dark outside, but sometimes we're blocking out the light around us if we're traveling or if we're in a hotel room, someplace where the light is unusual. We want something um, so that sweet dreams mask might be the ticket. So we are going to be making, let's put together our um, solid fabric mask first. So in this case, I have cut out some pieces. Now, 
How cute is that? Little snowman print. That would be perfect for travel, you know, coming down to Christmas time. Um, we're trying to get sweet dreams it, in the when it's getting closer to Christmas. We want to have some good sleep. Now, I, um, you could trace this early and cut all of it out. But when I do that, I tend to have a little bit of a shrinkage, a little bit of a, an adjustment happens when I go to quilt this. So what I'm going to ask that you do so that you have success with yours is to layer the batting, the fabric batting, the front side of your fabric and a backing fabric, simple cream color scrap from another project layer those up and then quilt this. In the quilting process, most of you will realize that that draws up and shrinks your project a bit. So if you were to cut the layers out ahead of time, then you're gonna have a shrink and shift of things and to, to kind of alleviate that or bypass that happening, what I'm asking is go ahead and layer those, quilt it, and then cut out your shape. So in the quilting process, for some of you who haven't done a lot of machine quilting, you can. Um, in most cases, the batting is fairly mm, tacky enough that your fabric, fabrics won't shift on a small piece like this. But if you are afraid of anything shifting, you can easily use your safety pin method of pinning the layers together or you can use a basting spray just very lightly in the very center to keep the, the layers from shifting about. So choose the, the method that you enjoy or that you have access to and go ahead and do that quilting. Now, this is a really good place to practice that um, free motion quilting because on small pieces, we can maneuver them easily under the sewing machine. So with free motion, you would be putting on a simple little hopper foot like this. If I hold it up so you can see it, that way you can easily drop the feed dogs and do your quilting around. You might want to highlight. Maybe I want to go in and quilt around the snowmen, have them kind of pop up off the fabric a little bit. You can easily go in and do that or you can opt for straight lines. Straight lines are very classic. You would be using a walking foot or a dual feed foot. Or if you have an integrated um, walking foot on your machine that lowers a lever, there are so many different options for um, doing the free motion, or not free motion, but using a walking foot or something similar to it, like the dual feed anymore on machines that I can't just say use this because every machine has a little bit different. Um, to do those classic straight lines um, is on the pattern on the front cover, but I just use bright red thread. And yes, you can see the lines then, but the bright red across, just to do a simple cross hatch across the project. So whichever method you decide to do your stitching, it's up to you, but get that stitched, those layers together. If you're making like five or six of these, you can easily get all the sandwiches ready and then just start quilting, have a heyday, maybe practice a different stitch on each of the um, different one. Maybe do one as a meander, maybe one has double loops together. Um, there's just so many op opportunities here to do some practicing because the more we practice our machine quilting, the better we get at it. So your practice can be a gift in the end. So. Go ahead and do that quilting. Once you have it quilted, then go in, take your template, and you can kind of line it up on the design however you, you like. I would probably choose a couple of the snowmen on this one, kind of heads up, and go ahead then and trace that shape with your fabric marking pen. And this is going to be the cutting line. So I can trace either on the um, fabric front or I could trace it on the back but it's going to be the cutting line so this will not show and then cut out the shape so that you have it an exact well, let's see if I've got a longer pair of shears down here um, of course not I left them all upstairs in my other studio I guess we'll use the shorter shears the scissors here to cut this out 
But once you have your shape cut out, then it's going to be going in and getting those transfer lines. It's a little easier sometimes to make the transfer marks once you have your shape cut out because you really need that elastic um, placement spot on each side to get it kind of level so that it doesn't twist across your face. So once you've got it cut out, then you can go back and put in, just by sliding the template off to one side a little bit, you can put those little marks for the elastic and even for that opening. We gotta remember not to stitch all the way around our project because we do wanna leave an opening in order to turn this entire project right side out. Okay, now once I have my little marks on there for where to put everything, then it's time to take the elastic. And what I, this was kind of an interesting one. In order to get it to fit, you actually have to put it to your face. So I stitched one in place. I'm gonna just do a pin. Let's see, a shorter pin here, just for right now. And then you have to hold it to your face to get at least an approximation of how long this strap needs to be. You don't want it to be too tight. It can always be knotted or adjusted. There are um, those slip um, adjusters that we used for face masks and things that even can be used. So you'll wanna hold this to your face, take the strap around your head, see that you have about the right length. Mine was somewhere around 17, 16 and a half, I believe. So that would be the, the length that um, I would use over and over for mine. Yours will be personally fit for you. And pin that in place so that it won't shift while we go ahead and put the backing layer on. So I'm going to kind of adjust my pins here so that a little bit finer ones go through the elastic a little easier. But this loop can get in the way. So what I need to do is either put, um, you could use a wonder clip, you could use just simply put a pin in it, but remember there's a pin inside your mask. Um, I'm going to just put a pin across this so that the elastic stays out of the way of my seam allowance as I go to put this together. It's snowing in Bozeman, Montana. Oh my, already? <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you're inside and you're watching us instead of out there in the cold so um but every every time we uh sit down to sew we kind of let the world outside go away i i know that there are things happening out there today but we're just gonna have fun with quilting instead okay everybody agreed oh somebody is 82 degrees and beautiful in birmingham well of course in birmingham alabama it's gorgeous today okay to finish this one off with the um just the fabric that you've quilted and made all gorgeous. We're gonna put that right sides together and your instructions will tell you specifically how to stack things. So when you get going on it, go back and look at how to stack layers so that you are correct in your stacking. In this case then, I don't need to cut out my flannel layer or my fleece layer. I'm just gonna leave it large because I can use this outline now to guide me for my stitching. So I'm also gonna go in really quick, gonna put that marking. I should have marked my opening on the back side so that I can see where I'm stitching. So we're gonna stitch, we're gonna do a reinforced stitch at the beginning, and then we're gonna stitch around the shape and reinforce at the end so that we can turn this all right side out. Not gonna do the stitching on this one because I wanna get to the foundation piece and we'll stitch around that one. So this one's gonna go in the queue for now. We are gonna, I'm gonna reuse that fleece though because I really wanna use it on my next project. So they're stitched the same way at the very end. Now, in order to build, kind of a quilt as you go or piece as you go. Because so I'm not gonna actually um, go through the batting layer at this point on mine. I built this one just on a piece of fabric without batting um, involved in the piecing process. It just makes extra layers and I didn't really think that 
something this small. You won't need to worry about seams shifting or anything. So I just stitched it to a base. And I've got a base fabric here. Now, I did talk about tracing the shape onto the fabric before we started piecing on this one. And after I got done, I realized you probably don't need to trace it. So it's going to be a flip. Some people love to have control and know exactly where dead center is. And they want to make sure they have it just right. Others of us, we're just going to piece on here and not worry about it and trace the shape later. So decide which you are. Are you one that likes to control exactly everything lined up? Then go ahead and trace your shape onto the base fabric. If you're one who loves to just let things happen, you can do it that way also. In this example, I'm just going to leave the fabric plain without marking it, and I'm going to build on top of it. Now, I started one and got one all the way built out using some leftover Christmas fabric from years gone by. So a project a long, long time ago. <laughs> some of you are going to be like, I recognize that fabric, and you've been quilting like I have for for quite a few years. So let's, let's do some foundation piecing. So if you haven't done foundation piecing, this is a great place to start um, playing with this to see if you like this process because it is kind of freeing. It's not as exact as all those, you know, triangles and half score triangles and things that were our hexagons that we worked with. This is the time to just have a little bit of fun and build on the base fabric. So let's see. It does talk about cutting fabrics from one inch to one and a half in width, which would mean that leftover pieces of um, jelly rolls, perfect for this. If you have some that are a little wider than that, up to two inches, those work also. I was just focusing at first on the jelly roll because I had a jelly roll of this fabric that I'd used for something else and thought, hmm, perfect place. And it's kind of the soft roses, um, kind of tranquil, peaceful looking fabrics. And so I could cut up that jelly roll really easily into to some really narrow strips and build from with that. But leftover strips that we don't exactly want to throw away yet, we can use those also. Okay, so let's have some fun with a uh, candy cane stripe. I definitely am in winter Christmassy kind of mode, I'm afraid. My house doesn't look like it yet, but it's cold outside today, and um, I'm kind of thinking winter. So the very first strip can be put in the center, it can be put to one side, just pick a spot to start, and put right side up. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and pick my next strip and I'm gonna put that right side down. And it is important that the strips are cut with a nice straight edge. Sometimes we have leftover scraps and we've cut a jagged piece out. Go back and give yourself at least a straight edge there. I did cut all of mine in parallel form so that they are the same width end to end. That way I know that as I build across, I'll be done quickly. So give yourself a straight edge because that straight edge is going to be where you're going to position your quarter inch seam. So in this example, as I put these fabrics right sides together, if I flip this down, you're not gonna be able to see the edge, but this cut edge along here, that's, I'm gonna consider that the edge of my piecing and I'm gonna create a quarter inch seam there. The hard part in this example is that most fabrics are light on the back side. So it's a little bit hard for you to pick that up on the camera, but I'm gonna put a quarter inch seam across this and then take it out of the machine. And if I hold it up, you're gonna be able to see that red stripe across it. That's my stitching line. Then I'm gonna open this up and all the way to that seam allowance. Now, if my iron is hot, and I clean up my stitching or my sewing space here a little bit. We can press that. You can press with your finger also, um, but making sure that you're opening that seam allowance all the way up and then just give it a quick press. I know it's really easy to skip that process, but you will have a flatter project in the end if you take the time to press in between. Now, I've cut up all kinds of different fun 
um, Christmassy kind of prints here. I think I'm going to do this. And I love prints. I love dots. I love plaids. I love stripes. And in garment sewing, we were always so worried about making sure the stripes were straight and the plaids all matched up. But in quilting, we can have fun and kind of ignore that because the wonkiness maybe of the stripes and the, stri and the plaids can be part of the charm of our project. So in this case, some of these are fairly straight, but they don't have to be perfectly aligned and straight um, with the plaid or the stripe. Okay, and then we keep doing that process in order to cover our base fabric. Now I had you cut that five by nine. That's about the size that you will need to then use your template to cut it out of. So we're just gonna build, oh, I'm just gonna do symmetrical. It's easy, I have two of each piece. I'm just gonna do another dot on the other side. And this is where you're going to pick up your style. You're going to realize, am I a kind of a straight, everything has to be symmetrical kind of person? Am I going to let it be a little bit wonky as I'm going? Let, let's just be a little bit crazy. Instead of being perfectly symmetrical, I'm going to put the, the next piece in is the, the repeat of that candy cane fabric. I always wondered what these small pieces that I had in my uh, fabric drawers was gonna turn into. I just couldn't part with them from past projects. And so I've got just a small piece on each end that I need. So I'm gonna put one more on. This one have, that happened to have the selvage on there. So I'm gonna put it where it's gonna get trimmed off anyway. But right sides together, you if you get yourself a whole stack of these, sit down. You can listen to an entire book probably while you're <laughs> doing this process. But you can finger press it open, but make sure that once in a while you get to the iron to really give it a good press. Someone asks about a ghost line. What does it mean when you when I refer to a ghost line? So let's see if I can make a ghost line up here. Here is a piece of green fabric. Black, probably not the best for um, seeing on a dark green. But if I draw on this fabric, let's see if a ghost line will appear as it cools. It's got to sit there and cool just a little bit. Sometimes a kind of a white chalky looking line. It's not really chalk though. It's the chemicals in the marker leaves a little bit of a line behind. And of course, when I try to get a ghost line to appear, I'm not going to get one. I have gotten it to appear on other things. <laughs> Let's see if I can try another color. And this is a marker versus the pen style, but it does sometimes take a little bit of time for the ghost line to appear. Usually it's later and I'm like, oh, what's that? <laughs> so that's why I've always um, made sure that I use it somewhere that um, ah, this one is going to, this one's going to show up better. Okay. You got to let it cool because it's when it cools that the ghost line kind of comes about. Well, we'll let them cool there on the mat for a while. It's going to be hard to pick up because some of the ghost lines aren't really, really, really dark not really heavy. So it can be a little bit tricky to, to try and show you on camera what it means. But let's put this last piece across here so I can do my tracing and cutting on this one. And those ghost lines are hard to wash out. Um, they are a chemical that goes into your fabric. So it does need to be laundered to get it out. I have had it come out when it's laundered, um, but some people, if you're making, oh, maybe a wall hanging, you're not going to be laundering it at, maybe at all. Maybe it's just always going to live, you know, as a quilt that hangs up and it's not going to get really dirty that needs to be laundered. And when those ghost lines appear, it can be really distressing. Um, they mark really nice on fabric, but I said the ghost line is kind of the issue. And now of all the ones I made, 
There's a tiny ghost line, but I don't think the camera is going to be able to pick it up. There's a tiny ghost line toward the top of my fabric. It's a really light, but let's see if I can. Of course, when you want to show something <laughs> like a ghost line, getting it to show up on a light fabric is not going to. So that's that's what a ghost line is when it cools down because heat is the mechanism that takes the line away. But as it cools, now if I could take that fabric and go put it in the refrigerator, it would get cold enough that probably the ghost line would be a little bit more visible on this fabric, but it's not showing up really great here. But that is why we never advise that anyone use a friction uh, pen or marker to put their quilting lines on a quilt top because that ghost line can come back if it's not laundered enough to get the chemicals out of the fibers. I did do a test on that years ago where I, I marked every color of friction pen that was made at the time. I did the heat erase, it goes away, but as I put it in the, in the refrigerator to quickly cool it back down, um, the ghost lines started to appear. The kind of the sometimes yellowish, sometimes kind of white looking, chalky looking lines would appear. So I did a test then um, if I were to launder it with a mild detergent like um, like a dish soap that there's a brand out there that's blue that a lot of people will use in quilts because it's a very mild. It takes things um, out of fabrics, works great on clothes if you get spots too, but um, mildly washed it and then um, tried mark you know tried to see if the line came back and it washed away at that time. So unless something in their formula has changed, um, it should wash out, but we never want to go that direction because no one wants to really heavily launder an item probably before um, maybe gifting it. So, okay, thanks for watching everyone. Um, we are, the link for the project should be in this chat. So hopefully my moderator will go in and put the link in there again. If you're just popping in and haven't seen the link pop up, for making the Sweet Dreams mask. So just follow that. You'll have to put your email, I believe, into the link or into the box there so that you can then receive the, um, the file. So, okay, I made this one even a little bit bigger than I needed to. Okay, I've got wings out here. Okay, what we're gonna do here is I'm going to trace then my cutting line onto my foundation piece section here. I'm going to actually, let's do on the one I did earlier and I'm going to do it on the back side so that you can see my cut, my um, trace line. I can't believe my ghost line didn't want to pop up of all the things. I've had it happen before on projects in this like, but always remember which pen you're using also. Um, while I'm marking this, I can tell a ha ha on myself. I was making a quilt label and I picked up a marker and I traced out all of the, um, the say the quote that I wanted on my quilt label. And then I wanted to heat set the ink. So I set it to, to took it to the ironing board and pressed it and it all went away because I picked up the wrong marker. So make sure that these are going to be for marking, but they are it, it was, it writes a lot like a, um, now I'm going to lose my term, um, the mark, the pens that we use for making quilt labels and uh, picking up the wrong one to write your label, ha ha on you, it all goes away. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. Now our next step on making this mask, I'm going to borrow pieces out of my other one here. So we have the front piece, foundation piece. We have it traced out. I'm going to use the um, rotary cutter. You can use the scissors, whichever you like. You know, exactness, close counts. In this case, I'm just going to slide around my curve here to cut up my mask. So then I have that shape. Oops. I think I need a new blade. I'm skipping like one thread. Oh, is it time for you guys to put a new blade in too? Because it's frustrating to miss just like one little tiny thread when you're cutting. 
Okay, almost at the end. And now, since we built this on a piece of muslin, in order to get this to be, um, to block out light enough, I would suggest putting a piece of batting, so cutting out a piece of batting to put onto the back side. And then you can choose flannel, fleece, whatever you want. In this case, the um, fleece goes pretty good. It's nice and soft. Um, I like it as, as a possibility for against my face. And, um, but you also need to, before you do, before you layer them all together, remember your elastic strap has to go in place. So pinning, and then I found it beneficial to take this to the machine. And since I already know my length on this one, I am going to place this where my notch is, and I'm going to do just a tiny bit of machine tack it in place. Just because pins, I'm gonna get stabbed if I end up um, using pins there a lot. Machine based is so quick, I can just go in and run a few stitches across, making sure that I keep my elastic flat so it's not twisted. Same thing you would think about if you were putting a handle on a bag, lining that up with my notch. Do a quick machine based on that end also, so have it in place. And then I bet you all know where we're headed next. I need to get this layered inside. And I wonder if I have a wonder clip down here. I don't think I do. Nope. Okay, it'll have to be a pin or maybe a safety pin. That would probably be safer for me. I'm apt to stick my hand in there and get stabbed and then bleed on my project. Not fun. So a safety pin to hold it in place. And then right sides together. We're going to stitch all the way around the outside. Now, those little markings that I have on my leave the opening. I'm going to put pins in for myself, kind of like a, a starting gate and a finishing line so that I remember not to stitch all the way around and and close it completely. So do a little tack stitch at the beginning to reinforce so I don't pop my stitches. We're using about a quarter to three eighths of an inch seam allowance. If three eighths is easier for you, then go ahead and use a, a little bit wider. Everybody has a preference there, but just kind of let the machine take it through around your curves. I didn't really find the need for a walking foot in this pro, um, portion of the of the process. It's small enough. I put the stretchiest fabric on the bottom, so the the fleece that has a little bit of give put it on the bottom so that my presser foot wasn't shoving it out and away from me. Okay, I'm getting my second pin. Okay, reinforce stitch there to close to finish out, snip the thread. And like I said, if your seam allowance isn't perfect, shh, we're not gonna tell anybody. We won't tell Santa, you haven't been naughty, so. Okay, then it's time to just basically trim all the way around, taking away our excess fabric here. There is one step that does give you a better outer edge, and that is if you clip the curved portion. I'm also gonna leave, here's where my opening is, right in here. I'm gonna leave that fleece or flannel, whatever your backing or backside of your mask is gonna be. I leave that a little bit longer. It's a little easier to maneuver later inside um, to when you do that last turn. I'm going to trim away the excess batting along where the opening is. So I'm taking the batting back to um, where my stitching line would have been in that area. I find that turning those areas are a little bit easier if we don't have all that extra there. So the fleece is a little longer. The batting is trimmed to where the seam allowance would be. You can put a line and draw a line if you'd like, but Close counts, we're, we're doing a craft here, not, not making a, an heirloom quilt. And then 
going in and snipping, that's what nice, the, the sharp scissors, the sharp tip, you don't want to clip the stitching line, but you're gonna clip the seam allowance all the way around the outer edge of the project. This allows those curves to relax a little bit and this, that excess fabric to um, find a place to, to kind of nestle in as you turn your project right side out. So you wanna go all the way around your project. I'm just gonna do one side for now. <laughs> yeah, using scissors to cut things out sometimes, yes. And sometimes I just, I know they're scissors, but they're upstairs. And a rotary cutter, as long as you keep your fingers back, you can you can cut around a shape fairly, fairly close. But if you have the fear of nicking your finger, Stick with the scissors. Everyone has a different comfort, comfort level. Okay. I guess I'm just going a little rogue today to, to uh, accommodate myself. We're going to turn this right side out. And this part can all be done like in front of the TV. You can sew them all out. And then at night, if you have a whole stack of them that you want to you know, work on, you could sit with the scissors and do the snipping and the trimming, all that, uh, and the turning in front of the TV if you want or in the car if you're traveling with somebody. But turning this, the fleece is very forgiving. So I can get almost a nice curve, but the nicest curve is here where I've done my snip into the seam allowance all along there. So it turns really nicely. I can take my pin away where I held my elastic out of the way. We're gonna work with that opening. We're gonna turn our fabric to the inside and the fleece. And see where this is a little bit longer on that fleece. You get something to get a hold of to do that turn. And you're going to get it lined up nicely. Take it to the iron and give it a quick press. And you're going to press the entire outer edge. I kind of just start with that because I know I have to get that nice and pretty. So I do that part first. Take my strap out of the way here. And once you have this turned, then you're almost done. The last thing that I did was then to go and stitch a top stitch all the way around that outer edge. So you can see the top stitch here all the way around the outer edge. Keeps that edge nice and flat. And then go back. And you can do this first before you do the top stitch. Totally up to you turn those edges to the right inside and do a little um, hidden stitch by hand to close up the opening there. And you have your Christmas Sweet Dreams mask all created. Um, someone says, I love my jacket. And guess what? I got it at a big, big box store. I keep getting asked if I've actually made my jacket and I'm thinking, well, I could have, but I didn't. <laughs> so I totally cheated. But you as a quilter have a good eye. We pick up anything that has those triangles and shapes in it that make us, um, just make us happy because they, they reflect what we do for a living or for a craft or a um, pastime. Um, let's see, what have we got here? Um, quilted earplugs. Oh, you could do a head mask or a mask that, or a headband that's quilted with a fleece inside. That's a possibility. I would probably make a straight piece and leave a little bit for a wider elastic maybe in the back, but something that covers your ears if um, you're going to be wanting to block out the, the noise in the room or the area where you're staying. Or if you've got a job that works nights and you really need to block out the light and the sound, that's a possibility too. See, we as quilters take one project and then we get the idea and we run with it. We create so many fun ideas and that's why I love bringing you projects every other week. So thanks for joining me. Remember to go into the chat, download the pattern so you have the template and the instructions and I will be back I won't be back until November or until December. So be looking for a project that has a little to do with Santa later. So thanks for joining me today.